Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to RBCM at Outside, a Vietnamese Canadian experience. I'm here today uh, with my guest, Crystal Fan, who I'll uh, introduce in a moment, but welcome. My name is Liz Crocker, and I'm a learning program developer on the learning team at the Royal BC Museum. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I am in Victoria today, downtown Victoria, at Government and Fiscard. There's a lot of construction going on, so um, hopefully the sound will be okay. We're going to move away from it uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge that here in Victoria, we are on the territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, also known as the Lekwungen speaking people. And uh, we're very thankful to be able to, to work in this, this beautiful location. Um, so uh, the format here, you're, some of you are in Zoom, some of you are in Facebook. We will have time for questions at the end. This program is usually about 30 minutes. We might go a little longer today, might be as long as 40 minutes or so. Um, and we'll save time for end of the questions. Um, so if you can hang on to your questions to the end, that would probably work best with the technology we're using today for miking and sound. Uh, but if there's anything urgent, you can type it in the chat or in the Facebook and Jenny will let Crystal and I know, otherwise we'll take questions at the end. Um, so yeah, so. I'm going to turn it, things over to my guest, Crystal Fan. So Chris, I first met Crystal. She used to work at the Royal BC Museum actually years ago as a fundraiser. So that's when I first met Crystal. But now she is working as an oil painter, mostly focusing on the uh, Vietnamese Canadian experience in her paintings. So we're going to see some images of her paintings. And she has graciously um, uh, allowed me to accompany her on this. We're going to go on a little bit of a tour of some places around Victoria down here, which were really significant to her family when they first came to Canada. Um, but I'm going to let Crystal tell that story. And so I'm going to first flip the camera and then you'll see her there and I'm going to give her the mic. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. So. Okay, yep. great. Um, hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, we are here in Victoria's downtown Chinatown because it was one of the first places that my parents felt a sense of community here in Canada. And we'll get to that um, a bit later as we visit some of the buildings here. But um, first off, I guess I should just get into the story of how my parents came to Canada originally. So they left Vietnam in 1979, which was about four years after the official end of the American war in Vietnam. And they came from a small rural village in the south of Vietnam in a province called Sok Trang. I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, <laughs> I was born here. <laughs> yeah. And um, what happened was though, my parents were 18 and 19 years old. And the original idea was that my father and two of his friends were going to escape the country. I mean, they had uh, family members and friends who had fought for the Americans and they were afraid of communism. They didn't know what was gonna happen or what the future held for them. So my father who comes from a fishing family had this retired fishing boat that he um, reworked and fixed the engine and painted it and got it ready to um, go on a journey. They, him and two of his male friends, they had decided that they were going to try and sail for Singapore. Um, but what happened as it does in small towns, the word of mouth spread and then people started to hear what their plan was. You know, my dad said that he had gone to a wedding and then his uncle was there and his uncle was like, I'm coming. Our, our whole family. So then his family was on board and then my mother was on board and then her brothers came. And so by the night that they were going to leave, there were 23 people um, getting ready to cram this fishing boat, which was four feet wide by 20 feet long. So imagine that pretty cramped. And this was a boat that was designed for um, river use. No one had ever been on the open sea. And so they didn't know anything about it. So they left uh, in the middle of the night uh, through the Hao River and as they were leaving the coast of southern Vietnam they were chased by police boats but what they uh, saw was that there was smoke coming up from one of the boats and um, they so they think that you know the police or coast guard or whoever it was um, that their boat broke down the engine broke down so then that stopped the chase and they were able to escape so they spent actually three days and three nights on the open sea um, it was very dangerous. There was really bad weather and they were very lucky. They said on one of the days um, where there were a lot of ocean swells, when they were at the bottom of that swell, all they could see around them was water. It was so frightening. And my dad was like, yeah, we're gonna die. <laughs> that was it. 
And my cousin was on board. He's a nine-year-old. So that was the youngest uh, kid on that boat. And Jenny's showing the picture of your father on a boat. Oh, that <laughs> is him returning to Vietnam. And so that's uh, his hometown. You can see that it's very water-based. Um, that's, uh, I'm taking the photo of him there and he's kind of reminiscing about, you know, life on a riverboat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, I think, you know, that looking back, they said if had they known the dangers, they would never have gone, but they were very young, you know, so, and not lucky because they were only on the ocean for three days and three nights and, but their engine broke, their water barrels broke. They didn't know what to do. And my dad was the one who was navigating. So he felt extreme pressure. But then on that third day, looking out in the ocean was a clear day. He, my dad said he saw the stick sticking out of the water far, far away. And he saw what he thought or realized was a helicopter landing on that tiny little stick. Um, so he's like, I don't know what that is, but that's where I'm going. And so they rode there for six hours. And it ended up being a Shell oil supply ship of Dutch origin. And the crew took them on board and they were there for 10 days. There was no, uh, there was a big language barrier so they couldn't communicate, but they were just remembered them being very friendly and kind. They feel that they probably used up all their hot water uh, taking showers. And they said that uh, the chef there cooked them macaroni with tomato sauce, which they thought was delicious. They never had that. But again, they didn't know what was going on. Their boat that they came on was tied to the ship. So one of their, um, one of the people in their party actually in the middle of the night cut the rope because they were afraid that the crew would send them back on the ship and go out to sea again they just didn't know what was going to happen so um what ended up happening was that uh supply ship uh sailed them to Palau Bidong which was a small island off the coast of Malaysia which was where a large refugee camp had been created um that actually ended up processing over 200,000 Vietnamese refugees in, through its lifetime. So my parents were there for four months while they waited for resettlement. They had originally applied to go to Australia, but the group that wanted to stay together, which was my mother, father, my mother's two brothers and the nephew, so four men and a woman, uh, there were too many men in their party, so they were rejected. But Canada actually ended up taking them on compassionate grounds because my mother was pregnant at the time. So that's how they got on a plane and went in Canada. Yeah. So um, before we start talking about their first few days, maybe we can start walking yeah. over to. And Jenny showing the photo of the plane. So that was the airline. That plane. was a postcard of the plane or the type of plane that the government, the Canadian government had chartered um, to send the refugees over to Canada. So they actually took that plane or plane like it to Montreal, stayed at an army camp there for about 10 days. And there they were processed, they were interviewed, and then they were told where they were gonna go. So when they were told they were going to go to Victoria, which was on an island, they were scared. They had just come from an island. So that's the only reference they had was this refugee camp. So they thought they were going to another refugee camp, just like that, so they had no idea. So they got on a plane to, a little bit further, I guess. Um, they got on a plane from Montreal to Vancouver. They wanted to get out of Vancouver because they saw all the lights in the city. They're like, oh, let's get out here. <laughs> but no, they were <laughs> destined for this island. <laughs> yeah. And but then when they got here, they realized they saw how clean it was. Uh, they saw that there were lights. Like, oh, this is a modern place. It was a modern place, and so um, they were okay after. Uh, after a few days. I mean, they came in the nighttime, so they couldn't really see anything. And they were driven straight from the airport to the Strathcona Hotel downtown. Yeah, so that was their first experience coming straight from the airport to downtown. Um, and so they got, they got to know a lot of the places downtown. They didn't have a car, uh, so they had to take the bus or walk around. And so one of the places they would go to is Taisang. So this is, I don't know if you can see that okay. Are you safe? <laughs> so one of the reasons why, well, there's two reasons why this is an important place for my parents. It's because um, 
one, it was the business owner, a woman who was Chinese Canadian, but spoke Vietnamese, who showed them a lot of kindness. So not just to them, but to a lot of the refugees who would come here, uh, they would buy groceries, she would give them extra food, even she would deliver rice to them when they moved outside the hotel, they were so kind. Um, and another reason is that, and so that this became like a place where they would, that would become part of their routine as they became new Canadians. Another reason is that they created kind of a new cuisine, like food is very important to a lot of cultures and Vietnamese uh, in particular. And there's some dishes that I feel like they created here. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Um, so where they're from, there were no grocery stores. It, everything was kind of how we wish to eat today, where everything's local, we produce seasonal and um, fresh. So a lot of vegetables, rice, fish. And so they didn't know processed food. So here was their first experience with that. You know, my mom said that in the hotel, she couldn't eat any of the food because it was too foreign to her. Like a lot of dairy, wheat, um, things that were heavier for their uh, digestive tract, but my dad loved it. He said that he had what was called the captain's feast every night, <laughs> which makes sense because anything that's a platter, a feast, a bucket filled with seafood, that was what my dad loved. And so it was great that he came here to a coastal community um, because seafood is so important here. But early on, they were very poor. So here they discovered uh, mama noodles which is so instant noodles became a big thing. They were really cheap. Um, but instead of making boiling the noodles and eating it with the soup the way it's supposed to be prepared, they would boil the noodles and then stir fry them with Chinese sausages. That's what we would eat. And another one uh, is sardines. Uh, a1 sardines and tomato sauce, which they would have received in the refugee camp. And what they would do is they would take they would take a can of these sardines and then we would all eat it with a poor boy bun. And I mean, I still eat that today, except, you know, back then when we were poor, it was four people eating this one can of sardines, which is what we did. And now it's just me eating the entire. <laughs> yeah, and that, yes, that painting is uh, like that dish. Just eat it up sardines in a poor boy bun. <laughs> yeah, so that this was an important place. It's new owners now, but you know they still they still shop here. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, once in a while. Yeah. So maybe as we walk over to the second location, we can talk about the other places that they would go to during their first few years that we can't uh, go today, but. When they first arrived here for the first three months, it was just ESL class, that's it. They really wanted to learn English enough so that they could start working. And so they, there was a ESL class run by Camosun College at a campus um, in a building that no longer exists today. But there they were separated because they had different language skills. So they had learned from the other refugees who had come earlier how to take the bus. So they did that. And, and they loved it. They loved their teachers. They thought they're funny and so nice. And it's where they met their first Canadian friend. One woman, Eleanor, who was a great friend to my mother in the beginning, gave my mother her first outfit. And so that was a black blouse, oh, sorry, a white blouse, black pants and shoes. And she wore it every day. And her, um, Eleanor's son gave my father his, found my father his first few jobs. It was like cleaning, janitorial work in nightclubs and mowing lawns. And <laughs> it was a start. And, you know, they didn't have spare time. They didn't do anything other than work. Uh, my husband, uh, who came with them to Canada, he was so 10 when my mom had given birth to my sister and he was charged with babysitting because they were working or at school all the time. He didn't like that, but <laughs> and he didn't know what to do with the baby. Um, but otherwise they would go to places like Goodwill, um, Fields, uh, Woolworth, these place, places that don't exist anymore, but places where they could get really good deals when things were on sale, just household items and groceries. And 
Hey, walking and talking is college. <laughs> um, yeah. But one of the things they had a, to get used to was walking. Uh, they never walked in Vietnam. That wasn't a thing you did. I mean, no one had cars either, but they had bicycles and motor bikes. You know, scooters, motorbikes, nothing over 150 cc engine, but um, that's how they got around. So they were very tired <laughs> learning to walk. <laughs> I guess we can um, stand on this side. Yeah. We can uh, stand on this side and you can see it. It's closed today. Okay, so we can walk. So we're just approaching Loi Sing Butcher, which people in Victoria will know is the oldest Chinese business in Canada. But the reason that we're here is that it's another place where they experienced a lot of kindness that supported that supported um, my parents and a lot of Vietnamese refugees when they first came. So the butchers here would give my parents free uh, carcasses. So you couldn't, back then they said you couldn't buy uh, bones, like stock bones, but the anywhere there was a Chinese butcher. So not just in Chinatown, but in other grocery stores. Uh, the Chinese butchers would give uh, the Vietnamese people free uh, chicken carcasses. And so what they did with that was they would cook it and make this um, like rice soup, um, gao ga, that's what we call it. And they would take the meat, little bits of meat off the boat and the cartilage and they would eat the cartilage. And then they would make the rice soup and that's how they survived for the first few years. And so it was really the kindness of the Chinese Canadian business community that really helped them and as the volunteers, uh, the Canadian volunteers as well for English language learning that uh, made them feel welcome. Yeah, so shall we walk up to the next? Let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> so as we're walking, I can talk a little bit about why they work so hard. I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> we're just heading up to my family's restaurant. So my parents worked really hard to send money back home and this is very common for uh migrant families uh they sent remittances home about 30 percent of their income they assume went to their families in vietnam and that was about at that time the first few years in the 1980s that was a hundred dollars so that would last a family uh four or five in vietnam for about a month and so they would do that and they were trying to repay back their debt to the canadian government the deal at the time was that the government would sponsor them over and they just have to pay back the cost of the ticket, which was $750 per person, and which is about $2,200 in today's dollars. But that took them about three years to do to pay off. So they ended up sponsoring eight other family members. Um, so all of my, almost all of the, my dad's brothers and sisters and his parents. So when they came, and that was about 15 years later, and saving money for that uh, took them a lot of time because not only did you have to pay for their way here, but you'd have to support them for at least a year um, in order to guarantee um, their visas. So what happened was that my dad's family ended up making uh, starting a business. They started the Greenleaf Bistro restaurant here in Victoria, which now has three locations. And, you know, they used that money in turn to help uh, build a house in Vietnam. Um, I don't know if you can bring up that house photo, but uh, <laughs> so what you'll see there, I love this photo. I think it's really funny because it's two houses um, there on the left side, I believe you'll see a tiny little like shed looking thing, which is the original house that my dad's family grew up in. And they had that for many years. I think this was built, you know, after 2010, um, this new house, the giant massive thing was built. And that was through um, directly and indirectly through the support of all the family members who were able to give money not just for building and living expenses, but so that the family members who were still there could start a business and they had, they have a shrimp farming business, which is very successful. 
they employ a lot of the villagers there. So through all of that support, they could be successful. Yeah, and that's, that's about it as we walk. <laughs> A little quieter yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hand it back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so, Jenny, maybe if you could let me know what time it is, and I think we could maybe take a couple questions as we're walking up to Douglas Street. I hope the sound was okay. It was very loud for us. <laughs> Crystal did a fabulous job shutting out that noise in her other ear. <laughs> Yeah, we, we could hear you perfectly, so that's good. Um, we're currently at 1220, and there aren't any questions yet. However, there was a couple of slides that we didn't get to um, yeah. of some of your paintings, if you'd like to talk about some of those. Yeah, let's do that. And um, I'll, I'll mic Crystal. You go ahead and Perfect. show those, Jenny. Okay, so let's see what's... Oh, this is a... This is called My Still Life, and it's it's a play on the idea of a still life of, um, you know, food, um, which you can see way in the background of that painting. There's an altar with um, food on it, and there's a little girl who's got her arms crossed, and she's looking unhappy. So this is, <laughs> this is a memory of me um, being young and not understanding the cult Vietnamese culture. No one ever explained anything. So... Uh, every year we would have what I call Daddy Dead Day celebration. So it was a um, celebration of the anniversary of my mother's father's, my maternal maternal grandfather's passing. And so they'd have an altar with all this food on it. And then they'd have food for us, but you couldn't eat the food on the altar because that was for the spirits. And no one ever told you that. <laughs> but there's always like really good stuff on it, <laughs> like candies and stuff that you weren't allowed to eat. Uh, but we didn't know you couldn't ask. So that, so despite like the giant uh, meal that spread that's there, that um, would be amazing to anyone as a little kid, you don't, you don't know. So that's what that painting is about. <laughs> ah, so this is called Heart to Heart. And this is, it also demonstrates the way in which, you know, Vietnamese people eat where it's kind of family style where there's a bunch of dishes on the table and you can kind of pick at it um, as you eat. And this was based on, um, you know, the awkwardness of and maybe not uh, exclusive to Vietnamese Canadians, but the awkwardness of having, uh, you know, heart to heart conversations with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. So when I went to Vietnam for, I've only been there once and it was, it was in 2008. And this is funny to me because I'm crossing what they call a bridge <laughs> in my parents, in my parents' village. I mean, it's obviously a pedestrian bridge because you couldn't get a vehicle over it, but it looked so dangerous to me. It was really just sticks tied together haphazardly but it worked so I mean they came from that to this you know safety wasn't an issue back then for the family it I don't remember it wobbly I think I was just so focused on not falling over <laughs> oh yeah so here we are So, yeah, so this is it. This is my family's restaurant. You know, my father's brothers and sisters own this and they work here. And so all of them uh, work very hard uh, to maintain this and two other restaurants that they've opened on the island. And I think there's one more painting of the my mother cutting up a turkey. And you can bring that up. But... Yeah, so that is another food painting. Um, but this reflects the story that my mother told me about when they had first arrived in Canada and they got this kind of a food hamper uh, for Christmas and it had a turkey in it. But no one told them what to do with the turkey. So they didn't understand the cultural context around what that meant. 
And so they didn't know what to do. So they cut it up and they made curry for the year. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and there's another question. Oh, so that was my, this picture is of my parents on in the first year that they arrived in Canada. Um, and they were at a sponsor's house for dinner. And that's my mother with my sister who was born um, a few months after they arrived in Canada, which was, so they arrived in 1979. Yeah. Any questions, Jenny? No questions quite yet, but I okay, encourage I'm people to put them in the chat um, or the Q&A on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. Yeah, Jenny, it's Liz. I'm hoping you can hear me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you also, I wanted to just uh, direct people's attention to that link that's to that CBC documentary. Um, it's a recent documentary. Um, the writer's first name is Andrew. I can't remember his last name. Sorry. Um, but it's a really interesting and there's some audio and some visual uh, and it's all written as well. And it's about his, his mother actually kept a diary. The, his Vietnamese Canadian family came over in 1980, I think, and his mom kept a diary of their crossing, and it's unbelievable. It's really amazing reading. It's chilling, and it's adventure, and it's sad. It's good. It's just beautiful. And uh, anyway, so that's a really, uh, just for some added reference to similar timeline of Crystal's family coming, um, but they settled um, in Ontario, I believe. Yeah. So an interesting comment from my dad about that story, which was amazing. I think it's called the sky. Not, uh, yeah, so I don't remember, but it was, um, yeah, so that family had uh, paid for a crossing on a Hong Kong freight, uh, a freighter to Hong Kong. And you know, I told my parents about that story and my dad's like, rich people. I'm like, that was, that was what like a wealthy person could afford. I mean, cause it seemed like, you know, that was to me, from my perspective as a Canadian citizen, you know, that shows, you know, like for a rich person, I would think, okay, private jet. That's what I think of a rich person. But for, for my parents, like, oh, if you could afford to pay anything for a crossing, even if it was smuggling, it was like you were very wealthy. So I thought that was an interesting perspective. I, yeah. yeah. There was one quick question. Um, they said maybe I missed it because I joined late. But um, can you just explain again how your parents arrived in Canada of how they crossed? Oh yes, real quick, real quick. Real quick. Yeah, they escaped uh, in the middle of the night on a riverboat. Uh, they were found on the South China Sea by a Dutch oil supply ship, and then from there they were taken to a refugee camp off the coast of Malaysia. And there they applied for sponsorship to, and they got accepted by Canada. So it was about a four month journey. Thank you so much. Um, we have one other um, question is, and a comment is, love your artwork. Is there a Thank place you. in Victoria where I can see more of it? Yes, you can actually see it on my, oh, sorry. <laughs> you see my back? Um, you can see it on my website, actually. It's www.crystalfan.ca. Oh, and I have an art show coming up at the Chapel Gallery uh, in Victoria, and that's on January 21st. So you can also follow me on Instagram, um, and we can put the links up to that later. Um, and that's where I put up my new pieces. Wonderful. Thank you. We have um, another question is, does the Vietnamese community have their own temple? Yes and no. There are two Buddhist temples. Um, you know, Vietnamese coming from Vietnam, only less than half of them uh, are Buddhist, and then maybe 10, 20 percent uh, describe themselves as, as uh, Christian, and then the rest are, you know, atheist or animist. Um, so it's more like if you have a funeral, you have a Buddhist, Buddhist funeral, but very few people actually go and practice. Thank you for the answer. Um, we have another question that's come in that, what do you enjoy more, food or painting? Oh, wait, no. What do you enjoy painting more, food or people? That makes more sense. <laughs> oh, people, definitely people. But the paintings that I've showed were based on memories. So all my memories involve food. So 
<laughs> it's a necessary part of the painting. <laughs> Thanks for that question. And we have a comment from Facebook that this, this is very interesting. Um, I went to Vietnam early in 2020. Um, is there a significant difference in the political views in the North and the South? Yes, it's hugely opposite. I mean, the North is um, communist and the South is more capitalist. They have a more of uh, American influence and Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, the main city in the South is basically run like a free market uh, city. Um, there's not a lot of movement in between. People don't travel. So really there's, it's segmented in, you could say kind of three areas. So middle, north and south and everyone dislikes everyone else. <laughs> you know, they have, they have something to say about people in the center or people in the north and people in the south. But, um, you know, a lot of, from what I understand, a lot of people in the south, they just live their lives and they don't really get involved. Um, the northern government controls um, you know, education, media, and all of those things. So even if it's so like, if you're to get a language book for here, or a lonely planet, that's um, all northern material. And so if you even had like, yeah, language lessons, um, they'd be with a northern dialect, and they wouldn't understand you in the south. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> thank you for explaining that. We have another lovely comment that says, thank you so much. This has been a you're wonderful awesome. learning experience. Well, I'm and, very happy to do this. Thanks for joining. Yeah, and there's one last question is, do you know the current um, statistics or number of Vietnamese people in Victoria? Yes, I do. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't. I think um, there's about a thousand people here from what I remember. Um, so the last like long form census data for Canada was 2010 or so, 2006, 2010. And it showed about 10,000 in BC, I think, you know, less than a thousand Victoria and more than half of them in Ontario. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people came, you know, everyone knows about like the boat people because that was like a big thing in the media. But before that, you know, 15 years earlier, just at the beginning of the war, there was a smaller migration of about 5,600 people to Canada. And these were the educated middle-class Vietnamese people who in New French because Vietnam was a French colony until the mid 20th century. And so they actually came here in 1965, but they all uh, immigrated to go back because they could speak French. I didn't know that they were middle class uh, educated Vietnamese people <laughs> because I grew up and, uh, you know, in this rural, um, you know, farming community of people and all the people who came from there when my parents came were the same, right? So. Well, Lee, thank you so much. Those are all of the questions and comments. Thank you. So I'm going to flip. I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to have Crystal in the background there. Thank you so much, Crystal. I know I'm not looking at you now, but thank you for enlarging my view of Victoria. I've been here uh, for 25 years and I had no idea about stories like, like your family's stories. So thank you for that. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. We are recording this, so it's going to go on YouTube. So you can always uh, see the full program later or share it with folks. We'll, so we'll get that up in the next couple of days. So thank you again, Crystal, very much. And uh, stay safe and dry, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.